ask you to sound your phone. I'd like to ask you to stand up and let's all take a moment or two of prayer. Before we even start the service, the sermon, let us take a moment in the service of prayer. Prayer for the country of Iraq, prayer for the army of Iraq, prayer for the president of Iraq, prayer for the churches in Iraq, in Baghdad, in Kurdistan, and elsewhere in Iraq. There are many, many believers. Pray for the difficulties that, are, that they're going through and pray for the help to restore order, peace, law, and, and, and that there will not be chaos there, that this chaos will come to an end and out of it will emerge a stronger church, stronger believers in Iraq and increase both in number and in stature and in quality. So I'd like to pray with you and uh, if anybody feels moved to pray, please join me in prayer for Iraq. So before I even start myself, if anyone here moved to pray for Iraq, go ahead. Lord, again, we bring for you the believers in Iraq and as our hearts are knit together with them, we don't know the suffering that they're facing them daily there, but we ask for uh, a tranquility as they need rest at night and as they're making decisions quickly during the day that they may also help fatherless and widows that are, that are home. We also want to pray for those insurgents, the enemies of things that are right. We find that it's right for us to pray for the enemies that are in Iraq. You, we don't know how to treat them in love other than to present the truth to them of the complete salvation. And in, in uh, the Son of the Most High, Jesus of Nazareth, we ask for help for those that are trying to share that message over there in word and action. Uh, we, we ask for the leadership and anything that they need to be repenting of. For you again, the comforts and the blood of Jesus Christ, which you will mention. Amen. In heaven, we Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, to, uh, to help us see the things that are occurring in the last days, Lord. This did not surprise the Lord, as I read this mention. In the Bible, it describes Babylon, Lord, and when we do pray for the churches, and we do pray for the uh, believers that are there, and we know that all things work together for good. Yes. God, where we should not be surprised. I know that you're not surprised, and if these things don't come to pass, then Lord, you're not coming. So it should not surprise us, Lord, and we know, Lord, you have a plan. And you know what you're doing. We don't know what we're doing. Yes. But we know that you do. Uh, you know what will happen. We know right before it happens. So it should not surprise us at all. And the Lord says, many are called and few are chosen. Lord, just like the, the gate is now, Lord. And so, Lord, we're just going to wait to see uh, on your prophetic calendar what you plan to do. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Father, we thank you for this opportunity to lift up before you our dear believers the Iraqis Lord we pray for them both in Iraq and outside of Iraq so many believers from Iraq outside of Iraq we realize that they are heartbroken that they are praying and we pray with them we join with them the Iraqi believers all over the world you have made it that the Iraqis were scattered in order to save them so many got saved from being scattered and now even more they're being scattered even more lord we pray that this scattering as my dear sister said will be turned for good for the salvation of many iraqis and we pray for the church not only to withstand this onslaught this chaos this war that is raging right now but that the church will emerge as a stronger church both in the south as well as in the north bless the pastors of Iraq. Bless the believers of Iraq. Bless the workers in Iraq. And we pray also for law and order, that the government will be able to get enough help that peace, law, and order will be restored to Iraq. We commit them to you. We thank you for this opportunity. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And before you sit down, we're going to read one verse of Scripture together from 3 John, verse 4. 3 John, as you know, is one chapter. And it goes, 3 John, chapter, uh, 3 John, verse 4. Uh, Amen. Let's read it together. I have no greater joy than these things to hear that my children walk in the truth. Please sit down. Today is a great day for fathers, but it's a great day for everybody because we're all connected to fatherhood one way or another. Whether you are a father or a mother or a son or a daughter, whether you are planning to become a father, hoping to become a father, to all of us, the same goes. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. It's a great day, Father's Day. Somehow it took a long time for it to become official in this country. It didn't become official till the year 1972. Whereas 58 years before it, Mother's Day was made official. I don't know why, but our society delays fathers. Somehow our society is not giving fatherhood and fathers the place they really deserve. God likes fathers. God himself is a father, and God wants fatherhood to be recognized. There is a sociologist by the name of David Blankenhorn who made a study in prisoners, male prisoners in particular, and he noticed that they have one thing in common, most of them, they did not have fathers while they were, while they were growing up. Isn't that amazing? That we realize the importance of fatherhood. Fatherhood is very important for the kids and it's specifically the right kind of fatherhood, the best fatherhood, the godly fatherhood. We need fathers and we need more than fathers. We need godly fathers. Because godly fathers is what knows who knows how to give the best gifts to their children. What do they give them? They give them Jesus Christ. And what better gift is there to be given to children than Jesus Christ? Godly fathers are people who can pass the legacy of Christ to their children. And we need, we need to pray for godly fathers. We need to pray for more godly fathers. And if there is anything in society that will change society, it is both godly mothers and godly fathers that will change this society. So we should all aspire to be like godly parents, godly fathers and godly parents. And John here speaks to these people not as a physical father, he speaks to them as their spiritual father. John had preached the gospel to many. In his ministry, he has had many converts, people who were born again as a result of his ministry. So he speaks to them as he is their father. And he says, my children, I have no greater joy than this, to see you, my children, walk in truth. No greater joy. And I'd like to speak to you today about what is the best fatherhood. But more than that, what is the greatest joy of the best fatherhood? What brings joy to the best of fathers? And it is that. It says there is no greater joy to me. These words can be the expression of fathers. There is no greater joy to me than to see my children walk in truth. So I'd like to before you bring before you five points about this best fatherhood. I call it fathers at their best. Fathers at their best. I'd like to talk, you about, talk to you about the greatest joy that is brought to those best fathers. First of all, I'd like to tell you that this best, this great joy that is brought to those best fathers is only, comes only to fathers who are Christians. That's right. It is only Christian fathers who will experience the greatest joy, 
when they see their children walking in truth. Nobody else can experience as much joy as a Christian father who, or mother to that effect, who are seeing their children walk in truth because they want to see their children become like who? Like them. No wolf is happy if his offspring becomes a sheep. No ungodly man cares whether his children will become Christians or not because he's not a Christian himself. If a man is ungodly, what does he care? But if a man is godly, he cares. He becomes wanting to see his children come to the truth. I hear of Abraham praying for Ishmael because Abraham wanted Ishmael to be godly like him because Abraham was godly. But I don't hear of Ishmael praying for his son Nabayot. He didn't care. Ishmael did not turn out to be godly, so he didn't care. Therefore, we never hear about Ishmael praying for Nabayot, his son. <clears throat> and I fear that there are some fathers, many as a matter of fact, who don't care. They don't care whether their children are becoming godly or not. They don't care whether they're following Christ or not. They just say, let them be happy and let them be wealthy. Put the girl's feet in silver slippers and many fathers say that's enough as long as she's happy, healthy, and wealthy. It doesn't matter what she does. It doesn't matter whether she walks in the broad road or in the narrow road. Who cares? My daughter goes to such and such university. My daughter has such and such position. My daughter runs, drives such and such car. And that's all what it is to them. Unfortunately, those fathers really don't understand that those kids of theirs have been entrusted to them in order to be guided to the knowledge of the Lord, of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I say to fathers who are like this, who don't care, wake up. If you cannot say that verse truly and mean it, that your joy is not in seeing your children walking in truth, it is because you yourself are not walking in the truth. When fathers are not walking in the truth, what do they care? As long as my child can pay his bills, her bills, and go to school and have a car and have health insurance, who cares about the rest? But to those fathers, I say, wake up. Because if you are not yourself saved, that is the reason why you are not desiring for your children to be like this. Godly fathers, the best fathers always desire. They derive their greatest joy when they see their children walking in truth. And knowing the truth. And espousing the truth. Yesterday we were witnessing at Seal Beach. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, you learn so much from those outings. Am I right? Those who were yesterday. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a university by itself. Go out there and just interact with these people and get almost every, every kind of response, every kind of excuse. Those who are refusing the gospel, oh, you should hear the excuses. One guy told me this. He said, you know, I think I'm a Christian. After all, I was baptized as a child. I said, when did you become Christian? I said, when I was born. And I'll get, I said, no, you see, ba being baptized doesn't make you a Christian. Said, he said, really? And then you start the argumentation. And said, I said, you have to be changed. Christianity is not something you're born with. It is an event, a change that happens to you when you come to realize that you are a sinner, that you need to repent of your sins, that you're heading to hell. That's right. No conversion happens unless one realizes that he's on his way to hell. And that's when you start seeking conversion. And I pray that today that if there's anyone here who's still not certain about his or her salvation, that you realize that hell is for nice people who have not sinned much. In fact, all it takes is one sin. If anyone who keeps the entire law but offends in one, he is guilty of all, James 2.10. All it takes is one little sin. And who has not sinned? You need to come and hurry and be saved. That's right. Let the blood of Jesus Christ cover all your sins by faith. 
That's right, by faith. Throw yourself at the mercy of God and tell him, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and be saved. And I want to tell you, when that happens to you, you can truly say then, I have no greater joy than to see all people around me, my children, my relatives, my friends, everyone that I come across, I want to see them come to Christ. Walk in truth just the same way I'm walking in the truth. That great joy that comes to the best fathers is can only come to Christian fathers. Second item about that great joy, that great joy that comes to the best father, fathers is only fulfilled when its objective is visibly seen. What does it say here? Could you read it with me? I have no greater joy than these things than to what? To hear that my children, what? What's that word? Walk. I want to see them walk in truth. A godly father does not say, I have a great joy that my children know the gospel. That's good, but that's not enough. Or they're attending church. That's not enough. Or they are really opening their Bible once in a while. That's not enough. A godly Christian father is not happy unless he sees with his own eyes his children walking in the truth, living the truth, living Christianity visibly. He wants to see them practically Christians, behaving like Christians, speaking like Christians, ministering like Christians. That's when his heart is at peace. That's when his heart is joyful. He does not say, I think they're Christians. I don't know. They told me they're Christians. No, no. I want to see it. I have no greater joy unless I see it with my own eyes, that I hear it, that I visibly see that they are really Christians. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you, we fathers, we fathers who have been entrusted with our children, have no greater joy than to see our children truly living Christianity. I tell my children, if you want to give me the greatest gift, I pray that you be living Christianity before me. Don't fake it, but that you be living it for real, because that is the greatest joy of any Christian father. No greater joy is there than to see his children walking in the truth. So today, if you want to give your father a great gift, ask your heavenly father to empower you to be able to walk in the truth, to truly live Christianity. That will bring joy to your heavenly father and will bring joy to your earthly father as well. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Another translation says, in the instructions, give them specific practical instructions so that they know what Christianity is all about. And that you'll be their coach <clears throat> in what Christianity is all about. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 says, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging Comforting. First Thessalonians 2.13 As a father, and for this cause we thank God with us, that when you received the word of hearing, you welcomed the, the, uh, the word of God, not as word of men, but as it is truly the word of God, which also effectually works in your uh, belief. Would you uh, turn to the second one, the, the verse right after it? For you, brothers, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea and Christ. For you also have suffered these things by your own countrymen, even as they also by the Jews. He's thanking the Lord that these people, despite the suffering, despite their all that they went through, were able to persevere and persist in their walk as Christians. They were practical Christians. Practical Christianity is real Christianity. When sons are walking in integrity, in prudence, in godliness, in grace, walking in the truth should be visible and there's no joy until fathers in Christ see their children walking in the truth. When the daughters are walking in purity, in chastity, moderation in their clothing and their, their apparel and having that meek and quiet spirit that is very precious in the eyes of the Lord, this is what brings joy to a godly father. This joy 
is only for Christian fathers, this great joy can only be fulfilled when the actual, practical, visible object has been fulfilled. And thirdly, that joy of Christian fathers is a healthy joy. It's a good joy that Christian fathers should seek it and demand it, so to speak. They should try to grab it from their children. How? By displaying authority. We need to pray for fathers nowadays, especially in our today's society, that they will take back the role of head of the family. <laughs> Have you noticed that? How fatherhood has been just put as marginal nowadays? When, when you want to ask something from a family, you go to the mother nowadays. Now, mothers, I'm not trying to put you down, but I think God has made it that the father, that the man is the head of the household. This is not very popular nowadays. It makes you look like you are old-fashioned. But I want to tell you, God is old-fashioned. And God still has the man as the head of the household. And uh, we need to pray for fathers to take that role of being the heads of the household in order for them to display the authority that it's due them and that this authority will filter to the kids and will bring joy to our Heavenly Father and will bring joy to fathers as well as to mothers. We need to pray and we need to pray for fathers to not to be hesitant in demanding from their children to walk in truth, reminding them with authority. I want to tell you, Hannah was very happy to see Samuel wearing that ephod that she brought him and serving in the temple. But I want to tell you, the husband of Hannah was also as much, if not more, to see that his son listened and he is doing what he's supposed to do, serving at a young age. I think it brought a lot of joy. Happy is Abraham when Isaac, his son, did not argue with him when he was offering him as an offering. Can you imagine? Abraham taking his son Isaac and Isaac and saying, Dad, don't do it. He submitted to his father. Happy is Abraham who saw his son Isaac submitting to him. And happy is David who saw Solomon succeeding him and following in his footsteps. Folks, I want to ask you, who are our successors? I want to tell you who are our successors. It's our children. It's our children. Children physical, children in the faith. These are the successors. These are the future of the church. We need to display that authority that bring it up with real enthusiasm, with real seriousness that these are the successors that will continue the walk and the life of faith. We need to pray for fathers to take that authority to become really the heads of the household again. That this society has that has marginalized fathers. That's not how God wants it, wanted it to be all along. God always wanted the fathers to be the heads of the household. They're the people responsible, after all, financially, aren't they? They're the people who are responsible. They should be really the heads of household in everything. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 says, Wives, submit to your husbands. And then it reminds husband to love your... I'm sorry? What? <laughs> That's not very common nowadays. Be subject to your husband as it's becoming in the Lord. Verse 19, it says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter against them. And verse 20, it says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. It says that if you want to please the Lord, obey your fathers, obey your mother, honor your father and mother children this is the way it should be fathers need to take this responsibility and take it seriously with authority i am the one responsible for you and uh, they need to display that authority and they need to play some this discipline i think discipline is has been lacking in households and that's why it's just things are falling apart i think good fathers are fathers who discipline right Bad fathers are bad fathers who do not discipline. Many times we kind of confuse the two. We say, oh, he's an easy father. He's nice. That's not nice. An easy father is not a nice father. If your father loves you, he should discipline you. Look what it says in Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. It says, my son, do not despise the chastening of God, Jehovah, nor be weary with his correction, verse 12. For whom what? The Lord Jehovah loves, he corrects even as a father corrects 
the son in whom he delights. If your father loves you, he should what? Discipline you. Has your father disciplined you? I'm talking to the youth. Has he said some touchy, stingy word to you lately? Do you think he did it because he loves you or he hates you? It says here, as a father who loves his son. As the father, as God who loves someone, he corrects him. Fathers who correct their sons, who discipline their sons, are good fathers. We need to pray that fathers take that role of authority and the role of disciplinarian in the house. This is the role of a father. They should crave, they should work into obtaining, deriving that great joy. There will not be great joy until there is authority and discipline in the house. Someone wrote and said, a child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. God will discipline, so should a father. God loves you, so is a father. God has authority, so should a father be. So first, that joy belongs only to Christian fathers. Secondly, that joy is only fulfilled when the real precise object of it has been visibly, visibly reached. And thirdly, that joy is a healthy joy. It should be sought with authority and with discipline. And fourthly, that great joy that John speaks about in 3 John verse 4, that great joy is the result of persistent prayers. I want to tell you, if you really, if we fathers want to see our kids come back to us, come back to the Lord, we need to be on our knees for them. That's right. We need to be on our knees for them. I like... Uh, our dear brothers, uh, today we got uh, some gifts for fathers, and I think one of them is a notebook. That's your prayer book, so that you can put your prayer request there. Like we uh, <coughs> spoke last, we need to be praying people. Fathers, mothers, people who are responsible, spiritual fathers. You have people you're speaking with about the Lord. Do you have a prayer list of them? Are you praying for them? It is only as we shed those tears that we will harvest the smiles. You cannot have smiles unless you have shed some tears. Can't expect things to happen just because it happened. I'm always, always amazed by the story, the parable of the prodigal son. We spoke about it last week, how this father was always waiting for him. He was always waiting for him. You see, the prodigal son, he must have injured his father's heart quite a bit. Fathers, give me my portion that's mine. Could you imagine that little, little brat telling this to his father? How much the father's heart was, must have been broken by this rebellion. And then he takes his portion and he goes and spends it in a very liberal lifestyle. And then when it was all bad, he comes back in rags. He comes back in rags. He went... From home, well-dressed, he comes back in rags. I think the father should have kicked him out of the house immediately. But he didn't. But you know, that father, when it says, when he saw him from far. You know why he saw him from far? Because the eyes of the father were pointed to where the son went. He was constantly thinking of him. He was constantly praying for him. That father did not let go of that son, even that that son did let go of the father. Fathers should not ever let go of their children, even if they let go of them. Remember, every prodigal, and we are all, in a sense, prodigals. Every single one of us, we were prodigals. Doesn't the Bible says in Isaiah 53, are we all like sheep? We have strayed, everyone went to his path, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We are all prodigals. So when our children become prodigals, become rebellious, don't give up on them. Keep your eyes on them. Keep them in your prayers. And keep praying, and one day, the prodigal will come back. And there's no greater joy than to see the prodigal coming back. So fathers, I want to tell you this as an encouragement. Don't give up. If you have a child who's still unsaved in your household, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your surrounding, someone who's dear to you, don't give up. I'm so comforted when this man one day walked uh, in, and he said, Folks, I want to announce to you that my sister finally got saved. It was 15 years ago that he had asked the church to keep praying for his sister. And he said, today we can all rejoice. Finally, she got saved. And this happened to us when the father of my wife 
finally got saved 15 years, as a matter of fact. It was 15 years after we started preaching the gospel to him and he was refusing over and over and then he got saved. How many more people can say, yes, I persisted in prayer and suddenly something happened. We need to be praying people, fathers who want to derive that joy are fathers who pray and pray constantly and make a habit of prayer. Do we have a time of prayer in our schedule every day or is this just when it comes? We all have a schedule and we adhere to it. We appear on time for work. We go to such a, we, uh, let me tell you, we don't ever miss food. Food is very much timely, you know, boy, it's sacred, like, oh, it's time for lunch. You have that lunch break, it's, it's appointed, and we have time for everything, and we have time for the hairdresser, ladies, and we have time for the barber, we have time for this, we have time for the cars, we have time, but do we have time with God? Do we have time to sit alone? Is this part of your schedule? Did you make it? Have you carved it? Have you said, from such and such time to such and such time, it is my time with God. I'm sitting with God in order to pray, in order to meditate on the Word, in order to lift up the loved ones in my family. We're so fast to tell other people to pray for us. Do we pray for them? Do we pray for one another? Do we pray for our children? Are we spending time in prayer? Listen, folks, this is not a joke. God is serious, and he's watching us if we're serious. God means what he says, and he's seeing if we really mean what we're saying. We believe in prayer. Are we practicing it? Are we people who are practicing prayer? How many minutes did you pray last, last week? Last week? yesterday, the day before. How many minutes do you spend on your knees or alone in a room praying? You'll gaze yourself. I don't have to tell you. I think you'll know if you're serious in prayer or not. I think those who are serious in prayers, who shed tears, are the ones who will cultivate and harvest the smiles and they will have that great joy to see their children walk in the truth. And fifth point and last point, I'll close with that, that great joy when he says, I have no greater joy, that great joy of the fathers, good fathers, godly fathers, the best fathers, is extremely serious. Think of the opposite. If you miss out on that joy, guess what the opposite? It's torment. It's horror. There's a man I saw this weekend this weekend was an interesting weekend. Uh, happened to be on call at uh, several hospitals. Uh, I have someone covering me this morning, by the way. But it's interesting that before I got covered, boy, I was hammered. At first it was okay, but then they start coming like, like gunfire. And as a matter of fact, there was a lady who was shot with gunfire yesterday. Had to go this morning, get involved in a surgery. And, uh, and uh, there was this young man who, uh, who was in misery, and then he was relieved from his misery. You don't have to know the details. But, uh, and another man also, and, and I always compare to these people, I say, this is just a miniature of hell. That little misery you're going through, that pain, that horrible time, that's a miniature of hell. Imagine what you went through, multiplied times 10 million, and lasting forever. And almost everyone will tell me, oh, that will be horrible. I don't want to ever experience that. And when they were relieved from their pain and aches, I say, this is your miniature heaven. Imagine that much joy of being relieved from pain, multiplied times 10 million, multiplied by eternity. What's your choice? And they say, oh boy, I don't want the first one, I want the second one. And I want to tell you, yesterday, uh, apparently there's, uh, in downtown Long Beach, somebody just sprayed bullets at people at night and uh, it shot several people they brought two or three or four at Long Beach Memorial Hospital I got involved with one of them the bullets went into the bladder bleeding etc a lady young la a lady etc and I was there this morning and uh, uh, thank God everything went well and she's blessed that the bullets just missed the major arteries etc she survived she's fine everything can be sealed holes etc and when I see what's going on with those shootings at school. When I see what's going on in accidents, not long time ago, those two kids on motorcycles, both of them died. They're related to a fellow who's in a Christian Arabic uh, um, 
uh, station. When I hear about this, I'd like to tell the youth here and the youth everywhere, don't think that life is too long. Always like to think that I'm young. I have plenty of time. How do you know you have plenty of time? How do you know? Listen, that time of separation from your godly parents who are constantly reminding you, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, is going to come to an end because your parents may go, but then you may go yourself before your parents. We're seeing more young people die nowadays than any other time. Accidents are happening at a, a very much higher rate. Crime is on the rise. What happens if you miss out on heaven? What happens if you wake up in this place of desolation, deprivation, this miserable place called hell? What would you do then? The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and what? And loses his soul. What would you do? I think it's miserable for us fathers who still have children who we're not sure if they're saved or not, to know that there's a possibility, a chance, my child can wake up in hell. And there's no greater joy that comes to a father's heart than to know that his child is safe. He has come back home. The prodigal is back. He took that moment, but now it's not just a moment. His life tells the story. It's a changed life. He's no longer feeding the pigs. He's now living at home. He's no longer out there with the harlots. He is living at home. He's not with the drunkards. He is at home with his father, rejoicing in the presence of his father, with a robe on him, with sandals in his feet, with a ring in his finger, and the fattened calf being slaughtered, and he's having a great joy being merry with his father in heaven. Come back home. So I say that joy... This great joy is special only to Christian fathers. We need to pray for more Christian fathers and for Christian fathers to persevere being the Christian father is supposed to be. That joy is only fulfilled when its true objective is visibly reached, that there is a walk. That joy is a healthy joy and should be aspired, sought with discipline and authority. And that joy is the result of persistent prayer. And that joy is very serious because the opposite is horrible. The opposite is horrible. You see, if you miss out on heaven, there's no nothing in between. For years, I was raised in a religion that told me there's something in between heaven and hell. And I thought, that's not too bad. You get a second chance. But I've been looking for it in the Bible ever since. I've been reading the Bible for the last 27 years. I haven't found that place called the middle ground. There's no middle ground. You either go up or you go down. If you're not sure you're going up, that means you're going down. And that's horrible. That is worthy of you taking a moment. If you are far from home, come back home. What we heard this morning, Brother Ed said, I want to be your father, says the father. Come back. Would you be my son? And if you are home and you're a Christian, you say, but I'm home, I'm comfortable, then let us go out and bring people who are still far and preach the gospel to them. Don't be selfish and say, I'm in. I don't care. Care about the people who are still out. Be the messenger of Christ. Be the ambassador. Be the ambassadress of Christ. And go out and preach the gospel. Yes, it is scary at first. I have to admit, the first time I gave a track on the streets, let me tell you, I was petrified with fear. I remember that because the guy who saw me doing it, he came and corrected me. He said, what are you doing? Because I held that track and I was shaking like this and I was giving it to a guy like this, looking, not looking in his face. And the guy came and he was talking. He said, you don't do this like that. You look at them. You say hello. I said, really? I said, yeah. Don't worry. They're not going to beat you. And if they beat you, that's fine too. You earn a crown in heaven. So I learned to say, hi, would you like to read this? And I was happy the first guy who took it and smiled at me. I said, wow. It works. Second time it got better, better. Come on, let's tell people about the most important thing in their lives, something that will make a difference in their eternity. Come on, it's okay. Take a step of faith and begin be of those who preach the gospel. But most of you are far from home. Return today. Return that you will be joyful. You will make your father joyful. 
you will make your earthly mother joyful, and you'll make your fatherly, your divinely father, very, very happy today. Let's bow our heads before the Lord. There's no greater joy, no greater joy. I speak as a father, on behalf of fathers. There's no greater joy you can bring to your father unless you walk in truth, unless you come to Christ, unless you make your salvation visible. Don't try to fake it. You need to be empowered to live Christianity. Christianity is not something you act. It's something that comes from within you. Unless you've been equipped, you cannot live it. Come. There are some things that are still holding you. Today is your day to bring joy to your father and to yourself. Let your father be happy. Let your earthly father be happy, but let also your heavenly father be very happy. Tell him you want to be restored to a relationship with him today. You want to come back home. Tell him, Father, I've sinned against you and before heaven, and today I'm coming back to you. And you see him hugging you, welcoming you, robing you, and throwing a party on your behalf. That's right. Instead of, instead of kicking you out, he's going to welcome you today. Instead of telling you you cannot come in, he's going to hug you and bring you in. As we heard earlier today, he's not counting your sins. He's already paid for those sins through Jesus Christ. Those sins of yours have already been paid for. Don't worry about how you're going to be received. You come in Christ's name. You are welcome in Christ's name. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No judgment for you. Judgment was taken by Christ. For you, it is the welcome only. The welcome party is yours. So rather than say raise your hand or something, I'd like to really impress about anybody who still feels far from home. Let today be the day that you say, I'm coming back home. I don't want you just to, to, to raise your hand, but I'd like you if you say and, and declare that I'm coming back home today. I want to come back home today. Lord, help me to come back home today. I'd like you to stand up right there. Stand up right where you are and tell him, Father, I want to come back home. I want to come back home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the Father who's always welcoming those who come back to you humbly, repentantly, and publicly. You bless those who declare their faith, who declare that they need you, who declare that they have, are far from you. And I pray today that you bless those who made that that eloquent speech with their with their standing and I pray for everyone whether they stand or not that we will have practical steps of sh of seeing of knowing of showing that we indeed have come back home to a loving father a father who has already paid through his son Jesus Christ for all our sins bless everyone here today and we thank you for this message and bring joy more joy to your heart and to the heart of every father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand up if you don't.